Uh, okay, uh, we can start this session. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here, and I will um, uh, I, I, I would ask the, the, the all the speakers to please follow uh, keep the, the the timeline because uh, after this session we we have the um, the main panel session that is beginning immediately, so we don't have any time for. Um, uh, any 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 time to compensate. So um, our first speaker today is Benjamin Koch, um, and uh, he will be telling us about vacuum energy, Casimir effect, and Newton's non-constant. So please. Thank you much. Um, of course, I want to thank you in the first place to come here after lunch break and Friday and so on, and also the organizers for the opportunity uh, to talk at this conference. And the title has been mentioned. It is about a work which has been done in collaboration with Rene Setnik and Mario Fitchmann and Christian Keding. And let's just jump into it. So the short outline for this talk. Um, first, to start off, I want to tell, okay, what we know, what we think we know, and what we would like to know. Then I want to clearly formulate the hypothesis, how I want to address these questions. And then, uh, at third point, I will present a framework, which is a framework particularly suited to include the two hypotheses I mentioned. And when the framework is set, I will study the Casimir effect. And um, then even look towards experiment. And then hof hopefully some uh, questions, discussion, and conclusions. So vacuum energy. What uh, do we know so far? So um, first of all, we we think we know that there's a quantum vacuum and uh, the experimental evidence most famously was um, given here by uh, Casimir. And what you measure in the, end if, in the end is that you have this quantum energy and it can accelerate plates. So if we look at the other... Okay, um, I moved to the wrong spot. So cosmological vacuum. Um, well, it's about, uh, we have heard a lot about it uh, here in the, in the context of this conference. It's about cosmology and how you measure it. Well, you measure an accelerated expansion of the universe. So you have an accelerated universe. So, and what we would like to know, at least this was the motivation for, for this work, is, is there any relation between what we call rho q, so the experimental uh, energy density in the Casimir lab, and rho lambda, the energy density of cosmology. Is this really quantum driven or has some different origin? A funny effect, uh, just aside, if you put in the numbers, they are of the same order of magni magnitudes if you calculate joule per cubic meter. So this, uh, are they related? This is the question. And if we can answer this question, we would be really happy. So let's hope to get to a happiness. So let's come back to Casimir, just in a nutshell. Um, it was predicted 1948. It took quite some time until it was first observed, 1997. This is like the simplest formula you, can, you find on Wikipedia for the energy density where A is the plate distance, H bar and so on, you know. So it's an um, attractive force if you can translate this energy density to a force. Okay. Um, if you do this project with experimentalists, there are more effects actually. So you have to consider if you think about uh, experiment. So first of all, it's done at finite temperature. This, so this modifies the dielectric properties. There's even a gravitational acceleration between the plates because the plates have mass. And if a precision experiment, you have this Newtonian force between the two massive plates. And you have to integrate over the, in, uh, over the mass densities of the plate and then you get a force. So this will be important for us, so please memorize this formula. Another effect which uh, is relevant is a penetration depth, which means that the electromagnetic modes, which have a boundary condition on the plates, are not actually perfect. Yeah? So the, if this blue thing is a plate, the energy density has is somehow penetrating the plate, because you, well, in real life nothing is perfect. So you have this penetration depth. So, and that's about 10 to the minus eight meter. And this tells us immediately that the energy density of the Casimir experiment is not a global constant, but actually depends on the space-time position where, where we're sitting. 
Okay, um, so we remember these two things, yeah? Newton's force and uh, space-time dependence. And now to the universe. Well, what better to start off than putting Einstein's equation? We have seen some of them uh, several times. You can go for the cosmological setting, uh, then discover the cosmological constant, which is an observational fact. I just rush over it because you, of course, all know. So there's this expansion parameter for the scale factor of the universe, and this can be interpreted as in terms of a cosmological constant in the Einstein equations, the red thing I showed you before. You can translate this to an energy density just by uh, fixing the units, uh, including C's and G naught, G uh, Newton's constant, and you get this value. Okay, and then the big question, which um, was also asked in the context of this uh, conference, is, is this of quantum origin? So this was um, first made by Seldovich and 1967, then made popular by Weinberg, 1988. And um, I think it's fair to say it's a big theoretical puzzle. And you can uh, reformulate this, also make an argument how it comes about that this is a puzzle. I jump over the argument. So this is uh, the same um, idea. So you calculate with your theory, quantum theory, the expected cosmological energy density and compared to the measured one. So Q would be calculated with quantum fluctuations and lambda would be measured. And this is of course famously a dimensionless lambda, lam, um, number of, well, wrong, 120 or depending on which mass scale you choose 55 orders of magnitude. So that's a lot and this is my original slide. So an unresolved, uh, unresolved issue experimental input needed. So having attended this conference, I learned there are solutions. So it's not unresolved, it's oversolved because I saw several solutions to this thing. So we have several solutions, maybe not as many as 120 orders of magnitude, but we have too many solutions. So we would still need experimental input to understand the problem. Yeah? So the motivation has shifted, but not disappeared. Good, so now I want to formulate the two hypotheses of this work. Uh, and the first is the question, is the Casimir energy density actually related to what you see in the Einstein energy density equations? Yeah? So is there any relation between the two or it's something completely different so we don't have to care? This hypothesis will come with a parameter, will be put on, we call it alpha. The second hypothesis of the work is, um, is the cosmological constant as you see it in the Einstein equations related to Newton's constant, as you see it in the Einstein equations. Um, well, this hypothesis we call, uh, we also com comes with um, parameters, C1 and C3 in our model. Um, well, they seem independent, these two hypotheses, but okay, the second one, for example, we have seen along this conference, when you calculate scattering, it seems like um, the couplings change, yeah, or RG flow, the couplings change and they change in a connected way. Yeah? One changes, the other changes. So this is like the second hypothesis. Okay, um, so let's go in more detail in the first hypothesis. So if you can put on the left-hand side to parameterize this thing, yeah, to measure something, you need an equation. So on the left-hand side, we put the cosmological energy density and ask the question, is this changed if I change my a quantum with rho q Casimir energy density. Does this produce a new cosmology real energy density? Does it subtract or add? We don't know, but and the parameter for this change we could call alpha. That's a fair way. So this would be of cosmological origin. That's a quantum modification if it exists. If not, alpha is zero, I'm also happy. And then we would have a modified cosmological energy density, okay? And now we try to measure this thing and we can learn something about the problem. Um, but there's a little subtlety here, since I told you before that this is a local quantity. So rho Casimir, the quantum one, it depends on where you are, the cosmological one not. So you cannot really write down this equation and uh, <laughs> without uh, accepting something. So what we have to rethink, if we want to make, make this hypothesis, you have to accept for the possibility that the couplings, rho lambda, G maybe also, 
can be local quantities. Otherwise, we cannot talk about this thing. Yeah? So they need to be variable. So this brings us to the second hypothesis. Uh, are the gravitational couplings connected? So in, in a sense of running, we, we are used to that. We have seen it a lot. Um, so if I change lambda, I change g or vice versa. So they, they might be connected. That's the second hypothesis. And we put parameters to this connection here. That's all, yeah? Now, um, this is just abstract hypothesis. We need a concrete model to calculate something. And this is now what, what we have been doing, but you might come with a different model. Um, so our model is a, like a minimal version of this. So what it includes is general covariance. We have a, just a small deviation from GR. It's a local uh, description, and you only have second order of uh, equations of motion. So which I show you now, this is the model. Five minutes, <laughs> okay. Um, so the model is like the Einstein-Hilbert action coupled to matter, but now we allow for this scale-dependent coupling. So all couplings in the theory, the matter coupling and the G coupling and everything can depend on a scale. So if you write down this action, we don't tell what it is. We can, of course, vary it with the metric and you get equations, which are the Einstein equations corrected by a term which depends on the scale dependence. Now, to make this a covariant closed system, you can have to do a scale setting. What we propose is a variational scale setting. You promote the scale to a field, and then you have it like a scalar field. You have a se second equation. So that's all. It's called variational uh, scale setting. It's covariant. And now we need to include also the possibility that everything is small. So we expand for small k all the couplings which might run and the couplings in the meta sector. And this automatically includes our hypothesis. Here we have lambda and g connected through k, and we, here we have meta and lambda connected through k. Now you have to just go and um, solve the equations for a given problem. And these parameters are the parameters I talked to you about. Before. So now we want to apply it in five minutes to the experiment. So it's a relativistic experiment. You can do the weak curvature expansion of the metric, the weak scale-dependent expansion for G, because you think if it's running, it's weakly running, it's Planck suppressed. So that's a Planck scale suppression here. Another Planck scale suppression here. And then you have the Casimir meta modes in the Lagrangian, which comes with this parameter. It's basically the Casimir energy. You know, so when you average over the quantum modes of this, you have this uh, row C here. So, and you get non-relativistic equations, a Poisson equation. What a surprise in the non-relativistic limit. The solution is, as you know, we have seen it before, with a slight change, and the change is that now we have derivatives of the scale here. And we have the scale setting, so it tells us, aha, it's derivative of the energy density, which depends on the Casimir energy density. And this is the modification. So we have the usual Newton um, equation here, let's say, but you have a slight modification which comes just from allowing from the scale dependence. Okay, and that's the take home message almost. So you have a different attraction between the Casimir plate. And it comes from this derivative of the Casimir energy density, which I showed you changes in the plates. And this can be tested in principle. So we have the two hypotheses. We have a concrete simple model and test for these parameters. Here we go. Um, so the experiment of my colleagues is called CANEX. It has been approved this year, so will be built. And it's so precise that it can measure both the Casimir force and the Newton force. And then we can ask, okay, do we see the Newton force as usual, or do we see a deviation from that? And from that, you can draw conclusions on these um, parameters. So what we now impose, since it's not measured yet, is just we want that this is a small, so the curly F and the usual F is a small correction must be smaller than one. Uh, and importantly, you have this spatial dependence of the Casimir energy density. And s since this appears in the equations, this can make a huge effect. And what we found to our surprise is these parameters, which we um, expected to reduce them on, of order one, because typically when I do quantum gravity experiments, the proportionality factor I cannot make strong suppressions because it's all Planck suppressed. But here the thing cancels out, and we have to get a very strong uh, bound on these parameters, which is surprising and quite cool. And now my time is 
to one minute, so take home message. So the take home message is not really our model. The take home message is take these two um, hypotheses, which I think are reasonable, good questions to ask, and if you do this, you find big, possibly big corrections to the Newton potential in this experimental setting, unless these hypotheses are small parameters. This ratio is small. So, and this will be tested. This is, I think, very cool. Second take home message um, since this happened in our model, and I guess it's such a generic thing, it should happen in different models. So if you have a different model which has these two hypotheses implemented, please look into that and make your predictions. Thank you very much. <laughs> and there's more things we want to do, of course. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, questions. Okay. <laughs> so, um, are there questions? <laughs> um, yes, yep. we have one. One. Uh, what? We, we have one short one. question. <coughs> ah, for the recording. Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, so we had a really interesting talk a few days ago about how to measure this kind of. Um, effects, uh, gravitational effects in, 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 in a lab. And uh, they were explaining us that it was really, really difficult to isolate many of the environmental noise. Uh, where is this experiment going to be located? Is it in Santiago or? Uh, uh, no, this is in Vienna. With oh, in Vienna. With a lot of noise as we learned in this <laughs> other talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, because I was thinking that in Santiago you have earthquakes uh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can kind of rid of it because the plates are uh, oscillating themselves. So, um, so you s always measure these differences. Okay. But okay, I'm not an expert in that. So sure, I cannot, sure. cannot really, I just trust. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. thank you. Okay, let us thank the speaker again. <laughs> okay, uh, our next speaker is Professor Zapata. And um, he will be telling us about loop quantization as a continuum limit in quantum gravity. Um, okay, uh, first, uh, thanks to the organizers and thanks to you that uh, you are here to look at this talk. Uh, where is the pointer? Okay. This is a conceptual talk and it's uh, short, so I'm going to go slowly, but uh, don't, don't be scared because there is not uh, much uh, explicit material uh, given. I just want you to understand very, very few things, and um, that, that's it. So the, the point of view that I am giving here is slightly different than some other points of view of other people that do loop quantum gravity, and here I'm taking uh, loop quantum gravity as uh, I apply the process that they call loop quantization to gravity. If you want to be more precise, I use some particular variables, okay? But it's a, a process that could be applied to other frameworks, uh, in particular to other gauge theories like Young Mills or something. I can loop quantize them and, and try to see what I get. Also to sigma models. So they have to be gauge theories, but they, they can be. Okay, and the, the takeaway idea for the whole talk is that the loop quantization uh, can be considered a, a continuum limit of lattice gauge theory, but, but it has to be complemented with something else. So to the, all the structure that we have in loop quantization or loop quantum gravity, we have to add a regularization map. And, and then I will show in that context that yes, we can get with, together with this regularization map uh, a precise statement of being a continuum limit of in, in the many aspects that it needs to be there. And that, that's what the talk is about. Okay, so I start with the results and with the main idea of what is this regularization map. So uh, he, here is what I already said, but in a formula. This is the sp space of generalized connections, if you want. And I'm saying that this space can be obtained somehow in terms of uh, sequence of some other spaces that I'm going to define here. And uh, the equality 
here means that uh, I have a space that I generate with this thing, and then I take a completion, and then I get this one. So in more mathematical terms, the space that I will get is dense here, and then when I complete it, I get the whole space here. So let me just explain what, what is the space, and I don't know if everyone here is an expert on loop quantization, but uh, on loop quantum something, but at least the main ingredients you, you will have uh, here. So uh, this A here is a, a parallel transport map. It's a connection, and I use it uh, to take, say, a path order exponential somehow to obtain an element of a group. Okay, so the, the ones that I'm going to consider, the, the ones that are called are elements of this A tilde, the, that, that's what I'm defining, and is a subset of all the possible connections here, are the ones that preserve some uh, equivalence class that I defined here. So he, see that the, this, this is a, a space Space time, if you want, or if you want space, this is a manifold where I'm going to be doing parallel transport. And parallel transport just assigns group elements to curves, and I have these two curves that are actually not, not the same, no, they are different. But with respect to this triangulation that I have here, that is, I see it as a, the composition of the manifold in, in cells, and I have here cells of dimension two, dimension one, and dimension zero, to each of them I can associate a sequence of cells. So first they are they start in this uh, two-dimensional cell, then they pass to this one-dimensional cell, then to this two-dimensional cell, then anyway, they all these two have this the same uh, they follow the same uh, journey in the in the sense of cells. They they are different, but for the cells they are the same. Say so they could I could have another curve that is very similar to this red one, but then exits in this direction, and then that would be different. Okay, so I have this equivalence, uh, this uh, red one and this blue one are equivalent in, in this sense of the, of the triangulation, and then when, if the connection is so that, such that it assigns the same parallel transport to all the paths that are equivalent, I call this, uh, these connections uh, this cellular decomposition, let me call it delta, so they will be delta flat. Okay, the, in the sense that the, when something is flat is when the parallel transport doesn't depend on the path. If I have two, one starting point and one end point, something is in senses curvature when, when the parallel transport depends on the path. Okay, so this will be uh, flat in this particular way with respect to the to the coarseness that the cellular decomposition let me see. So it's like a resolution scale, the, what, what I just set up. And, and then if I refine this triangulation, I, I can see, uh, I allow more curvature and then I can see more details. And, and so these spaces, these delta Ns, they would be, if I have a, Delta one that is a coarser triangulation and delta two is inside delta one, then there is a, a natural, uh, they are contained in each other. Okay, so the, the delta one, which is the coarser uh, triangulation, it will have very few possible connections. And delta two that is finer, it will include more connections because all the ones in delta one that are flat at this uh, scale of delta one, are also flat in the scales of delta two. Um, and so I, I get a, a way in which uh, I allow more and more connections, flat connections. Okay, so this is the space that I wanted you to understand and that uh, contention is what I call a, renormaliza a regularization map. So uh, one important thing is that the space of these connections, you can associate it with the space of connections in a lattice. So here I have this uh, yellow triangulation. If I draw something that is uh, called the barycentric subdivision, I just add more, more lines and I get a lattice. This, the space of lattice connections will parameterize the space of these 
of these delta flat connections. Okay, uh, and, and this is usually like the group to the number of uh, edge lengths. Yeah. So, okay, the, uh, let me see. So this is the result, uh, sorry, uh, about the space of fields that I obtained the whole space of fields in, in the loop quantization as a limit. And then what happens to physical measures? If I get the measures, or better said, states in the sense of this algebraic uh, talking of uh, the previous talk, okay, in this sense of uh, algebraic quantum field theory, I, if I get the states that let me calculate expectation values and correlation functions, then I can import them from the triangulation at the scale n to the continuum right, by this regularization map that I get. You just include the, the things and also with this inclusion map, you push forward the measure and, and then this gives you a measure here. But there's you take uh, expectation values of things here or, or functions there. Okay, and then what, why is this interesting? Well, here, I can play the, the, the game of re renormalization a, a la Wilson. And with that, if I have more than one of these things, I, I can go to critical points and do everything that the people do in the lattice. And after I have this collection of possible lattices with measures, I embed them all here and I want to ask whether they converge to something physical or not. After I did all the running of the coupling constants and I found the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the fixed point and all that, then I will get a way to calculate expectation values here that converges, okay? So if it converges, I, I call it the continuum limit measure even though maybe it's not a measure, it's just a, a, a thing that lets me calculate uh, expectation values and correlation functions. Okay, so this was all in general. Let me go to examples. In the continuum, uh, everyone knows that the 2D easing model is uh, a great model because it's uh, actually analytically solvable. So it's a non-trivial non model that uh, people already un understood mathematically at, uh, very precisely. Okay, so using these mathematical results uh, of, of here, then we, we can see that the continuum limit of the 2D AC model does produce for us a, 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 thing, a quantum field theory that converges. And it's not, not only convergent, but it satisfies the white, white man axioms and everything. So it induces a relativistic quantum field theory and, and it, you can say that it's loop quantized, okay? So it's a very non-trivial example. Uh, this other example, um, you know, when people started doing loop quantum gravity and realized that it's a very difficult thing, they, they went to do the easiest example possible that captures some of the mathematical properties of loop quantization, and this thing was called polymer quantum mechanics. Okay, when you have polymer quantum mechanics, you have a representation of the Heisenberg algebra that is not equivalent to the usual one. And then you get some very crazy things happening. Well, if you do want to take the point of view that I'm taking and, and you need to take a continuum limit, then the craziness goes away and you get uh, at the end, after you renormalize uh, in, in a sense that is a very, very mild renormalization because it is quantum field theory in one dimension only, then you get standard uh, Schrodinger quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is a very general thing. It holds for any potential that is convex. Okay, um, so what are the lessons after I gave the general results and then the two examples? Uh, lessons, scale. Here scale, I introduced it as coming from a triangulation or a set of triangulations that they, I said I was going to refine. But you can take it for any cellular decomposition of a manifold. And it sounds uh, a little strange because this is completely not uh, covariant or said in a very crude way regarding a triangulation, but you can say it also in a fancier way, saying that this thing induces a set of algebras and these algebras are related to each other uh, with this regularization map and also with the other map that I didn't 
talk about uh, because it's the usual one that we have in loop quantization that is a coarse graining map. So here we have uh, some sets of algebras that uh, have a partially ordered and directed structure in joining them and joining them also they are uh, regularization maps and coarse graining maps. And um, with this you, you get uh, what I told you before. Another, another lesson is about physical observable. So imagine that uh, you run this setting and you get uh, finally a theory and you want to add something to the theory, something that you really want to measure. Uh, and then these observables uh, need to be such that the limit that I write converges. And the limit that I write was exactly, the, uh, I, I didn't even write it, but I said that it was the same thing as, as I would do in the lattice. So I will have to do uh, something statistical, some like Monte Carlo simulation or something, and get in the space of fields and do some sampling. And these things would not converge if they are very punctual things. They, they have to be somehow ex extensive. They are the only things that converge. Um, so like measuring angles between things is uh, something that uh, one knows from intuition that is not going to converge. Uh, if somehow you measure uh, things that are going to be local, but using uh, collective behavior, some extended things, maybe maybe they will converge. Okay, but th things that from the beginning are just local, they don't. They don't. Um, physical observables, and then uh, one minute. Yeah. Uh, so phases in loop quantum gravity. We already saw in the dynamical triangulation uh, talk that there are phases in dynamical triangulations, can we see them in loop quantum gravity? And for that, uh, what is useful is to have some other parameter. No? And in gauge theories, uh, Wilson told us uh, almost everything, <laughs> including what are the good order parameters. And they are the Wilson loops. And there you have to see how the Wilson loop changes when you, when you change the C. But there is with respect to the background structure. And here you don't have background structure, what you have if, if at all, is the, the metric uh, that the state gives you, the, so the quantum gravity scale. So you will have to see how this changes when, with respect to the quantum geometry. And just uh, a warning is that you need time-like curves and time-like surfaces to, make, to say things that are interesting. And so challenges, uh, what do we need for all these things to work? We need something very important. It's called a renormalization prescription. And when you have a Hamiltonian that is gapped, for example, you need the first energy difference, or maybe you want to have a correlation length or something. So in gravity, we need one. And it would be nice to have something that is, in a sense, local, because we have everything kind of different morphic semi-invariants. Invariants. And, and then, is it would be natural to, to see if we have a piece of space-time, then maybe in this region of space-time, you do have a Hamiltonian, just a boundary term, and study if that can give you a, a, a good renormalization prescription. But this is just a, uh, I'm giving this proposal, but the, the main message is that we need one, something that gives us a renormalization prescription to run the renormalization group in reverse. And in this view of uh, loop quantization, I'm sacrificing different morphism invariants, but I'm thinking that in the continuum limit, it may arise, uh, come back, as it happened in the 2D easy model, and that, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have enough time for questions, so. Sorry. I will, we, we, we can postpone the questions for the uh, next session. So uh, <coughs> uh, let us continue on. <coughs> uh, our next speaker is, just a second. <laughs> our next speaker is uh, Augustin Silva, right? I, am I right? Um <coughs> and um, he will be telling us about the testing of the cosmological principle in a quantum universe. So please. Uh, I know it's Friday, so please bear with me a few minutes. Uh, 
I will tell you what I've been doing with my supervisor, Renate Lol. Um, and this talk will be following the lines of uh, a previous talk, uh, Beglock, who said uh, that we should be asking uh, the proper questions to our quantum gravity theory. And uh, he said that we should be asking, does your theory provide an emergent universe uh, that is of cosmological type? Does your theory provide emergent symmetries? And uh, we will be focusing on asking to causal, dynamic, ca causal dynamical triangulations if the theory actually provides an emergent universe with some emergent symmetries. In particular, we will be asking if the emergent universe coming out of causal dynamical triangulation uh, is uh, isotropic and homogeneous. So first, the outline of the talk. I will first um, briefly introduce what causal dynamical triangulations is and uh, why we want to study it. Then later on, I will focus most of the time of the talk into defining what uh, homogeneity is and how to define a, a quantum gravitational observable capable of quantitatively testing the inhomogeneities of an emergent space time. And uh, if I have time left, uh, I will also focus uh, on uh, explaining what uh, isotropy is in these kind of emergent universes and uh, how do we define observables for that. Uh, even though it's the one I'm most interested about, I have a very limited amount of time, so I probably won't be able to do this. Uh, and then, of course, my conclusions. So, what is causal dynamic and triangulations? Briefly speaking, um, it's a lattice version of quantum gravity. So, since it's very difficult to do, and probably impossible to do, analytical calculations in a full part integral of quantum gravity, you go numerical. So what you do is you discretize space-time in a particular way. Um, in, in, you can use different types of building blocks. They are actually relevant in the continuum limit, but for simplicity, one uses simplices. And uh, in causal dynamical triangulations, one replaces uh, the full part integral of quantum gravity with a sum over all possible simplicial discretizations of a manifold. And the beautiful thing is that when one does this discretization, uh, one discretizes the Euclidean Einstein Hilbert action, and the Einstein Hilbert action takes this very, very simple form that depends only on the number of building blocks that you're using. This is in four dimensions, so it depends on the number of vertices, on the total number of, of, of four simplices that you're using, and some coupling constants that are related to the cosmological constant and the Newton coupling. And the uh, beautiful thing is that this simple action is independent of coordinates. So by definition and um, by construction, the theory is diffeomorphism invariant. Now, the problem is that, again, we don't have coordinates. <laughs> so uh, there is no tensor calculus in these geometries. And if we want to extract geometrical information about these emergent universes, one has to rely only on two tools that are well-defined in these universes, which are distances, geodesic distances that you can measure in these quantum geometries, and volumes, that you can also measure volumes. And nothing else, because this is for an, an example of a particular configuration of a two-dimensional um, causal dynamical triangulation uh, that you can embed in 3D, so I can show you these beautiful plots. Uh, but it's extremely fractal and then non-smooth. So this has no hope of defining a tensor calculus in it. So if you want to do calculations, as I said, you can only rely on distances and volumes. All right, so why causal dynamical triangulations? As mentioned in some previous talks, um, there is a phase space in this, uh, in the parameter space of, of this theory, and there are some phases, and there is a particular very interesting phase which is called the Sitter phase that has the beautiful property that even though the configurations of the part integral, as I said before, are extremely non-smooth and fractal, they somehow conspire to give rise to a universe that has um, this shape here. If you put the spatial volume on one axis of the universe and as a function of the time, it fits a perfect cosine cube uh, uh, shape. This means this is the Euclidean version of a De Sitter universe. So somehow these very fractal configurations conspire to give rise to a De Sitter-like universe, and we want to study this universe. I want to emphasize that on the beginning, no one ever assumed any symmetry or any background. This is background independent, and we did no assumptions on the symmetries. And this directly comes out 
of the numerical analysis of the full non-perturbative uh, body integral of quantum gravity, which I believe is amazing. And we want to construct uh, observables to extract the geometrical properties of this emergent universe. We want to know if this the Zeta universe is actually related to our universe. And in particular, we want to study uh, homogeneity and isotropy. And the questions we want to, to address are, uh, so can we, using this, this emergent the zeta like universe, uh, somehow justify uh, the usually assumed initial condition of our universe as an isotropic and homogeneous, exponentially expanding universe, and therefore, does this emergent universe satisfy the bounds in inhomogeneities and isotropies, for example, for inflation to happen? Uh, to, to answer these questions, we need to construct quantum gravitational observables that are capable of testing quantitatively if the emergent space time is inhomogeneous or anisotropic. anisotropic. So let's go to the basics because we will have some difficulties. I will build the observables together with you. Uh, so this, for homogeneity, one has to go to the definition. So a homogeneous space, a space that has a translation symmetry of all its properties. Now, this has some difficulties because uh, there is no notion of group action in these uh, very non-smooth geometries. And uh, as I said, there is no tensor calculus. How do you apply a translation if you don't even have coordinates? <laughs> and also, this is a very restricted definition. Uh, in physics, symmetries, like for example, translation symmetry or isotropy, they can emerge at cer a certain scales. So we need to def have a definition that is scale dependent. If you're going to test symmetries, it has to be in a scale dependent manner. And symmetries might emerge at different scales. So we will use a more statistical definition of homogeneity, and also we will not use any group action. We will only use a distance measure and a volume measure, which is all we have in this causal dynamical triangulations approach. And we will define observables that are capable of testing this symmetry, as I said, in different scales. To do that, um, we will take ideas from astronomy. Uh, so in astronomy, if you want to know if our universe is actually satisfies the, the, the cosmological principle, what you do is you pick a chunk of the universe, which is, for example, this box here. This box has a certain size, and then you pick a property, which can be, for example, the distribution of mass inside this chunk of the universe, and you take the average of this property, and then you compare this average with other chunks of the universe, right? You make a comparison, a statistical comparison. And then if this coarse grain property uh, in this chunk of the universe is the same everywhere else, then you conclude that, for example, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. In our case, our universe seems to be homogeneous and isotropic at scales above 300 megaparsecs, but not below. So this is an, a symmetry that is scale dependent. And we we'll try to apply this uh, in a covariant way uh, to quantum gravity. But exactly this is the idea that we want. We, our definition of an homogeneous space is going to be that of a space looking the same everywhere and at different scales. So. As I said, we want to do this covariantly and uh, on using the only two tools we have. So our chunks of the universe, if you have an emergent universe like in CDT, is going to be a geodesic sphere. So we pick a scale, which is going to be the radius of this uh, geodesic sphere. We pick a property, which we will call Q of X. It's a local property. It can be uh, the scalar curvature. It can be the temperature. It can be a scalar field, whatever. And then you coarse grain this property in this chunk of your universe, which is going to be a geodesic ball. And you will compare this geodesic ball in a certain way with different regions of sp space time. So uh, to introduce some notation, uh, as I said, we define geodesic balls as all the points that lie at a certain distance from the origin. So x is a point in the space time. We know how to measure distances, so we know how to create geodesic balls. Uh, this is a notation for the volume of a geodesic ball, which we also know how to do because we simply count the number of, of elements at a certain distance. And then we define the coarse grain property, Q of X, as simply the average of a property inside its geodesic sphere at a certain scale delta. Remember that this delta is just the radius of the sphere. The larger the, the radius of the sphere, the more coarse grain your property is. Now, of course, if you want to make a comparison of, uh, of a certain coarse grain property, you need a reference value. The canonical reference value is uh, the mean value. So we take the mean value of this coarse grain property in a given uh, manifold, M, which is one of, in each of the body integral configurations, each of them is a different manifold. And uh, 
we take the average of this of this coarse grain property, which, as I said, can be any scalar property that you can measure. Sure. Um, naturally, you have a, uh, an observable that quantizes statistical deviations, which is a standard deviation. So you can measure the standard deviation of this coarse grain observable in over all the, the manifold. And uh, if you take the quotient of this standard deviation with the mean value, then you have an observable, which is a point independent scalar, scale dependent, because it depends on the scale, de that, uh, on the scale delta, that gives um, the, the numerical value of this observable is a percentile deviation from perfect homogeneity. So if you put this into your part integral and you choose a given quantity Q, uh, then this will return a number telling you, hey, your uh, ground state of your part integral or your emergent universe is a certain percentage of, has a certain percentage of inhomogeneities regarding this property. So this is what we do. We put this observable inside a part integral in, in our Kelsey dynamical triangulations and the resulting numerical value is going to tell us percentile deviations from perfect homogeneity. We can do this in two-dimensional CDT. Uh, we can also do it in four-dimensional CDT. Unfortunately, I'm really bad at coding, so I only have a code for, for two dimensions, but in the future, this will be applied in four dimensions. Uh, but as I said, this is a configuration in two-dimensional uh, quantum gravity, and then you can also do the same. You can construct geodesic spheres, coarse grain a property, and compare this property in different regions. So if one picks, for example, the scalar curvature in these in these geometries, one can apply this to our observable and obtain numerical values. These numerical values are in this axis, and in this horizontal axis you have the scale. So the larger your scale is, this indicates that it looks every time more homogeneous. Uh, in the case of two-dimensional quantum gravity, which is just a toy model, I'm not claiming this is something physical, but it indicates that in the continuum limit of this two-dimensional model, you get 20% percent size in homogeneity. So the fluctuations are 20% of the mean value, which is quite large. So this indicates a, a very inhomogeneous continuous limit. So I have how many minutes? Three? Yeah, okay, then I will just briefly sketch how the story with isotropy is. So we can also develop observables that are, that give you a, a, a quantitative answer to the question, is your universe isotropic or not? And uh, the, the thing with isotropy is a bit harder but uh, the, the main idea is that uh, instead of looking at homogeneity in the whole space time, you can just start at a point here, this point, and look at a certain celestial sphere around you and look at homogeneity on this sphere. This, this is basically what we do here on Earth when we look at the CMB. We just have a certain sphere and we look at if it is homogeneous or not. Uh, well, you can do exactly the same procedure in, 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 um, in these quantum geometries and you can compare in this spheres here on top of your celestial sphere, you can do some statistics and look if it's uh, homogeneous or not. So if it's homogeneous, a certain property on a sphere, then it means that it's rotationally invariant. And therefore, it is isotropic. Uh, the observable itself is too scale dependent. Now you have a scale, not only your coarse grain is scale, which is the scale of, of the size of the, the chunk of the universe that you're choosing, but also you have the distance at which you are looking at. Uh, your, your, your celestial sphere. So you have two scales, delta and epsilon, and you can make, uh, well, these beautiful plots uh, that will tell you a number of how anisotropic your, your universe is. In the case, of course, of two, again, of, of two-dimensional quantum gravity, you can just make these two plots, which is, this is the size of your celestial sphere, the radius, and this is kind of your angular amplitude, so the more you start coarse graining, um, then the more isotropic it looks. In the case of two dimensions, this is 1% anisotropies uh, regarding, for example, a property like uh, the coordination number, but you can, of course, choose any other property that you have access to. So I will jump to my conclusions because I think I'm running out of time. Um, we define quantum gravitational observables capable of determining percentile deviations from perfect homogeneity and isotropy of space-time. Uh, these observables ca are capable of being implemented in highly fluctuati fluctuating space times, as the ones that appear in, 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 in causal dynamical triangulations. Uh, we implemented them uh, in, in 2D, and the results indicate uh, that there could be some residual um, anisotropies and inhomogeneities in the continuum limit. Again, this is not something physical, it's just a toy model. We, in the future, will implement this in four-dimensional CDT to actually study this the CETA universe that I said at the beginning. 
and uh, a positive outcome of this would be that um, the number that you, we get from our observable tells that this emergent universe is actually compatible with the usually assumed initial conditions for the universe. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy your Friday afternoon. <laughs>Nice results, um, but when you say you're taking the distances or the counting up the, uh, you know, the total number of points inside the sphere, you're not actually measuring a sphere because there's no background, right? It, this is like a next to nearest neighbor or like counting the total number of neighbors around a point. Well, that's how we define a sphere. So we have a, a notion of distance, the geodesic distance. So in this discrete space time, you have, for example, the link distance. So if you start at a point, you, have for, you, you choose a radius, you can choose radius 10, distance 10. So you count all the uh, all the steps, all the steps that you yes. take, basically, and you measure, all, you construct your geodesic sphere as all the points that are at this distance. Yes, yes, cool. That's what we call a sphere. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so we are almost at the end. So the final speaker of the final session of the final day of the, <laughs> of the conference <laughs> um, <coughs> is, uh, okay, you will forgive me, Gregor uh, Celusta, did I get it right? Yeah, okay, so uh, he will tell us about the quantum computations in loop quantum gravity. Please. Yes. I'm going to talk about uh, our attempts to use quantum computers in loop quantum gravity uh, computations. And this talk is uh, based on these two articles and on the third one which is in preparing. And all of these articles uh, I wrote with Jakub Melcharek. So first let me uh, say a few words about uh, quantum computers. Uh, so quantum computers consist of qubits which are just two level quantum systems. Um, so the Hilbert space describing quantum processor uh, is exponentially large. For example, the biggest, the biggest one, uh, IBM quantum computer Seattle, uh, has uh, 433 qubits. Here we see layout of this qubit in the processor. Uh, so the mm, simulation um, state of quantum processor in general uh, using classical computer is exponentially hard. Uh, so um, uh, and moreover, there are unknown quantum algorithms that are faster than a classical one. Uh, for example, a uh, Shor's algorithm, uh, which factorizes uh, integers uh, and uh, has complexity logarithmic versus uh, exponential complexity of um, classical algorithm. Uh, but there are some problems with quantum computers, namely uh, each gate applied on quantum computer generates some errors and uh, qubits uh, have very short um, decoherence time. Uh, the solution to this problem is um, to implement error correction codes, but it requires many, many qubits because uh, each logical qubit um, um, have to has to be encoded in many physical qubits and similarly in gates. So in some future probably we obtain tolerant quantum computers where this noise and decoherence uh, uh, will not be a pro problem. Uh, but for now, we are in a noisy intermediate scale quantum era. So we need to use uh, short quantum circuits and uh, kind of, and the algorithms which uh, work mm, quite good on current quantum computer are rational algorithms because in this case, the noise is let's say not huge problem. But there is also one another problem, namely mm, transition between classical data and quantum data. Because it is often uh, the situation that um, 
embedding classical, cl classical data uh, on quantum processor is exponentially hard. And similarly, uh, obtaining classical results from quantum resistor also often is, uh, for example, re requires exponentially many measurements. Um, so uh, all of these things mm, lead us to mm, conclusion. Okay, the solution to this problem is to work as long as possible uh, using quantum data and not, not classical. And all of this leads us to the conclusion that one of the possible application in nearest future for quantum computers uh, are simulations of quantum systems in physics. And uh, we focus on loop quantum gravity, which as was said here many times, is background independent on participative approach to quantum gravity. Um, it is based on Hamiltonian formulation, and thanks for Ashtekar variables, mm, it expresses gravity as SU2 gauge theory. In loop quantum gravity, uh, quantum geometry of space is described by spin networks, which are graphs mm, with holonomies on links and SU2 invariant nodes. Mm, and these nodes are associated with quanta of volume. And uh, it is also worth to emphasize, to, to uh, want to mention, that uh, spin networks can be also used for general uh, gauge theories with a compact Lie group and a connection form. So uh, our um, method in principle can be applied also uh, to other gauge theories. Uh, we focus on uh, four valent spin networks with all, uh, with all spins equal uh, one half. Uh, because in this case, um, first of all, a qubit in quantum processor is basically a spin one half. So it is easy to uh, implement uh, links which are spins one, ha one half. And moreover, uh, after imposing Gauss constraint, uh, uh, obtained node is also a qubit. So it is also mm, uh, very convenient to express this on a quantum processor. Okay, here we see a fragment of spin network. Uh, we have uh, nodes associated with uh, Wigner uh, 4J symbols, and we have holonomy associated with Wigner matrix, um, and also G to lower and upper indices. Um, and we need to construct quantum circuits corresponding to these this tensors. So uh, in the case of uh, holonomy, uh, Holonomy in this case uh, is basically a pair of spins, uh, two spins, two qubits, uh, maximally entangled, uh, two qubits. So, for example, in the case of trivial hol holonomy one, uh, here we also this tensor G uh, um, uh, put here, so the, uh, but this is just convention. Uh, we need to prepare this state of qubits to encode this holonomy, and we can do it for example, using some not gate, not gate, Hadamard gate, and control not gate. Uh, the more complicated is the case of uh, interfiner, uh, because we need to mm, construct more um, complicated circuits, uh, which uh, correspond to uh, Wigner 4J symbol. Yeah, so this, this, this circuit with some X, some uh, square root of swap, and some other gates, this circuit uh, acting on state uh, of this form uh, produce state with coefficient uh, given by uh, Wigner for the symbol. Um, and now let's see, so, uh, okay, and now uh, first method of simulation uh, on the simple example of dipole, we have two nodes connected by four links and we want to obtain this state on quantum computer. So we first uh, prepare four states of links, so four pairs of qubits, and then we apply uh, this uh, W, uh, this Wigner for J symbol, and then we make projection on these three qubits. And at the end, on these two qubits, we obtain a state corresponding to a state of these two nodes, this simple spin network. Um, and then we can, for example, perform quantum tomography on these two qubits, but quantum tomography is quite uh, expensive, uh, so there is better uh, possibility. Namely, we can mm, 
uh, make so-called uh, quantum um, compile link. Uh, so we apply uh, some parameterized answers uh, and we mm, try to tune these parameters uh, such that this uh, answers will would uh, reproduce this state on these two qubits. So we can define some cost function, and when this cost function is zero, then our ansatz reproduces uh, exactly uh, state, and then we can perform some um, variational hybrid classical quantum uh, algorithm where a quantum computer um, computes cost function, and then a classical computer minimizes this cost, cost function. In, and in this way, we can find some parameters for which this ansatz will reproduce, in this case, a dipole. Uh, exactly the same way we can uh, do it for arbitrary spin network, for example, pentagram. Here we need to prepare uh, 10 uh, pairs of spins, then apply five mm, projections, and then also we can transfer this state on some parameterized uh, five qubit ansatz. And this, uh, this method is, uh, this method required a number of qubits, which is four times number of nodes of spin network. And there is a, a small problem because uh, here we have projections on zero states. Um, and this projection is implemented by post selection of results. So we need to reject uh, exponentially many results to make this projection. Project so it is not very good. Mm, it can be mm, partially mm, improved by partial projection. Uh, so, for example, we can take our pentagram, but we leave this uh, three, uh, this four uh, spins without projection, and then we can uh, glue together two sat um, spin networks and obtain a spin network with uh, ten nodes. And uh, using this partially pro projected spin network, we can build up uh, higher and higher mm, in the number of nodes uh, spin networks uh, with uh, not many uh, measurements. Uh, but there is also another second method which is um, uh, better, uh, which is a method which is sensory inspired method. Um, uh, here we uh, prepare um, quantum circuits corresponding to uh, tensors, uh, to Wigner tensors, uh, different quantum circuits for uh, different uh, position of indices of these uh, Wigner tensors. And we have explicit form of this uh, quantum circuits. Here I just put some blue rectangles, but we have explicit form uh, in terms of gates. Um, and here uh, the holonomy is expressed by single qubit gate because holonomy is SU2 element and single qubit gate is also SU2 element. Uh, so it is straightforward to just uh, take holonomy and uh, apply corresponding uh, quantum gate on single qubit. So in general, we take our uh, spin networks, then we translate it uh, into um, a tensor network and then we can construct a uh, quantum circuit corresponding to this uh, spin network uh, with uh, this quantum circuit corresponding to nodes and uh, this orange one corresponding to uh, holonomy. There is also some projection at the end, but the number of this projection is um, much lower than in, in previous case. Uh, and also we can uh, uh, prepare open spin network, uh, but open in the sense that uh, uh, there are some mm, free uh, magnetic numbers uh, at the end. And it is just by, uh, we, we just need to uh, leave uh, this, this uh, qubits corresponding to this um, magnetic numbers and then we obtain uh, state here we have state of nodes, and here we have state uh, corresponding to this uh, free uh, uh, magnetic number. So for example, uh, uh, one of the mm, possible uh, 
uh, application of this method is uh, that we can explicitly construct a bulk boundary map as a quantum circuit. Yeah? Uh, so we can take some spin network with a open spin network with some uh, boundaries and we can explicitly construct quantum circuit uh, which uh, takes as an input a uh, state of uh, bulk and it uh, has an, uh, as an output a uh, state of uh, bandar. Uh, okay, so to, to sum up, uh, we can construct uh, explicitly quantum circuit for arbitrary for valent uh, spin network with spins and one half and it can be used both as a tool for computations that are classically um, hard to do, and also as a quantum information characteristics of quantum gravity states. Because for example, uh, uh, we can obtain some um, measure of complexity of quantum gravity states by just looking on the number of, of, of gates um, re required to uh, obtain this, this, this state. Uh, okay, so thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, we have time for uh, one or two questions. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I want to know, have you actually tried to do the computation on, on a quantum computer? Uh, in very simple cases, yes. And how long did it take? Was it quick? Or compared to, uh, like, if I do it on a classical computer? Okay, I, I, in the case of uh, the small uh, spin networks, classical computer is, uh, but, uh, is faster, better. Faster, faster. It, it is uncomparable. Okay, <laughs> but for big ones? Uh, there should be uh, adva advantage of quantum computer, but... Uh, we need to have many qubits in quantum computer. So it should be. Ah, so not like, you know, IBM has this uh, free cl quantum computer card, it's online. So, so, but I don't know what's the number uh, of qubits. They uh, for free, there is seven qubits maximum. Uh, so this is. <laughs> so you have to pay. <laughs> yeah. And for, and uh, also in the case of paying, uh, there is maximally 27 qubits. 27. And, and how much, how many you, you need? Uh, for, exa for example, for example, here we need a uh, twelve, I think, qubits. Twelve. So it is it is possible. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, but we, we, we need to experiment more. Okay, uh, we are out of time. So let us thank the speaker again. <laughs> and this concludes the session. So now we should all move to the main room for CC two for the discussion session.